So um, the first keynote today, and up next, is our very own Dean, Morten Dan, who very kindly let us go back in time to just after he completed his PhD in computational mathematics, the 13th of September, 1989. So Morten Dan, he holds a master's degree in computational mathematics. He has worked at uh, USIT and part-time on Sintef. He has one publication, he has given talk, talks at renowned international universities, and he has toured the stages of Oslo with his own show, Mö, Morten and Eivin. <laughs> Moreover, he just defended his thesis with the title Box Splines and Applications of Polynomial Splines. And those of you who know me know that that's a topic close to my heart. <laughs> so, Morten, how does it feel to be back in your 30s? <laughs> Congratulations on your PhD. Thank you. It's glad to hear that you finished. I noticed um, that you've done a, quite a lot, and it's impressive, but PhD candidates from the faculty are exceptional. Right. They are. But do you know what you do next? I don't, I don't know. I'm, uh, I, I can do no, no, quite no. a lot of things. But, uh, but to help you along, we've invited headhunter Benedicta Stiff. <laughs> Um, and Petr Fafalius. Benedicta Stiff founded Kinder Stiff Consulting with Hilt Kinder, Kinder in 2012, a company focusing on management and board level recruitment. Stiff has over 20 years gained experience from recruiting to academia in FMCG, retailing, industry, ICT and culture, with industry disruption, sector convergence, and the power of transferring expertise between sectors as important core areas. Stiff holds a degree in psychology from the University of Bergen. She is leading edge expertise in this assessment and is an experienced evaluator of the ability of individual candidates and management teams to tackle challenges. Her experience with talent spotting involves work on div diversity and talented young managers through the seat on the board of Alaja from 2007 to 2013. So headhunter Petter Fafalios, is partner at King Bird, an executive search company focusing on attracting heavily skilled professionals and CEOs for their clients. He has more than 10 years experience from recruiting PhD level candidates for clients in the high tech industry and life science sector. Being a heavily licensed user of psychometric and ability to test batteries, he combines the systematic approach with a broad sector experience to find the best fit between candidate skills and abilities versus client requirements. His professional signature is a deep understanding of his client, this specific position and the potential candidates who are presented. Petr holds a diploma in export economics from the Norwegian School of Marketing. So right now on stage, headhunters Benedicta Stiff and Petr Fafalios We'll simulate parts of an interview with a newly graduated PhD, and that's you, Martin, <laughs> as well as giving all of you some tips on how to boost the impact of your LinkedIn profile. I hope that you all will learn important lessons today that will lead you to a successful career, whether in academia or elsewhere. Please welcome Martin, Benedicta, and Petter <laughs> with today's slogan, PhD candidate today, employable tomorrow. Do I, just, do I just press here, or, or is it, um, I mean, for, to, to get up the, yeah, all right, like this, or? You must not take it again. That's still there. What do I do? Yeah, okay. Uh, just to, to set the stage um, a little bit before we start the interview. Um, <coughs> uh, when... Um, the um, world outside <laughs> uh, hears um, PhD, a fresh PhD. Uh, it signals um, a lot of things, actually. Um, uh, and uh, uh, when it comes to competence, it signals a very analytical mindset, a smart person. We are going to meet a very smart person, probably. Um, and also, uh, it signals uh, a person that uh, has an in-depth uh, theoretical knowledge. 
who knows a lot about uh, a topic. And uh, we're curious to, to see whether that's transformable uh, or uh, can be used in other settings, right? So we'll try to find out something about that as well. And also, uh, we think that uh, this is probably a person who has a very um, uh, complex project experience. Uh, we think that maybe this is a person who has been working together with a lot of other people, maybe virtually, maybe internationally, and, uh, and uh, who uh, um, has, as uh, Anita Kron Poset uh, pointed out, um, the ability to, uh, to think uh, both in complex and probably uh, simplifying uh, also uh, the complex uh, topics. We'll check that out as well. When it comes to personal skills, we, uh, we uh, believe that uh, a PhD demands a large capacity. So we think that uh, a fresh PhD has a large capacity. Um, can do many things uh, in parallel, probably. And uh, also that the person who takes a PhD has a major academic interest. So uh, we maybe think that uh, a job could be too easy or too, uh, too um, little demanding <laughs> for a person with a, with a long, long education. So we'll check that out as well. Uh, and then again, we think that this is probably a very structured person and also a self-propelled, uh, or, um, or a, a person who is able to, to drive uh, him or herself to a result. So this is personal skills that uh, we want to check out if this person has as well. So um, I checked this morning, I checked um, finn.no to see how many PhDs do they want in Norway at the time. I found that 54 positions had the PhD uh, within the text, either as a, a demand for a background uh, or a theoretical background uh, or uh, as a part of the job. I mean, it was definitely some PhD uh, programs that was, uh, was advertised. But then again, uh, what it tells me is that uh, you have a kind of exclusivity uh, ex exclusive uh, arena as well, where there are only people with PhD or people with PhD who will be preferred. Uh, on other arenas, uh, there will not be a competitive advantage, uh, and then you need the, uh, the ability to, to um, uh, tell, uh, tell um, the world or the, the person you talk to about uh, what is... Um, uh, what is my background uh, and what can it be used for? How can I use my background? So we get back to that as well. Yes, next. One more thing. Uh, when we evaluate candidates, um, we always look at what can you do? That's the CV. What's my background? What's my theoretical background? We got the Morten CV, so we know that it has done something that is a, a, possible to, to list up, right? So he can, he can do something. And then again, there are two more points that is uh, more like we have to feel our way. The one uh, will is, do I want to do this? Do I want to have this job? What is my motivation? How can I use my background in a new setting? So that is the motivational part. If you flunk on the motivational part, you will probably also be unhappy in the job if you get it at all. And then the third uh, part is the cultural part. Do you fit? So what do you want when you go out uh, for, for a job? What, 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 what do you need to be happy? What kind of environment uh, would you like to work in? So uh, when I'm hiring someone, I'll check out, do you fit into our environment? So this is, this is uh, just a small part of it is what can I do? And a big part of it is motivational and cultural. So that um, uh, leads us to uh, the ability and the need to translate what you have done into what you can do. 
in the future. So that leads us to, to the, uh, the job. Yeah. Could you uh, yeah, I don't think uh, it's up there, you know. Uh, okay, we'll try. Um, it's up there. As Carolina mentioned to you, this is only an excerpt from, from an interview, so we're not going to run through the entire process. Uh, I'll give you some clues about, uh, well, uh, a potential position that we will evaluate Morton up against. Uh, and this is a position with, uh, within Ruter. Uh, I guess most of you who use public transportation knows about Ruter. That's the company that's planning and administrating all the different kind of uh, public transportation, um, uh, well, both trams and buses and uh, ferries and all of that. Um, and they uh, are, in this case, looking for a person that can be a um, uh, market and business analytical person. That means that this person needs to figure out uh, given lots and lots of information to find out the, the income uh, potential, to find out how the different kinds of um, public transportation um, uh, units, as in buses and ferries and so on, how they will uh, influence uh, if continuing within the same infrastructure as today, as opposed to how they are going to um, uh, uh, absorb the, the increase in the population within Oslo and, and Akershus. So, um, the things that we will be evaluating when, when interviewing Morten will be uh, the ability to uh, analysis about the different kinds of um, potential with different kinds of um, activities. Uh, what if the prices or the price structure or the, the ticket solutions are being changed? What, which effects will that have? Uh, his ability to further develop different kinds of simulation models. Uh, also his abilities to make and present reports uh, as... Um, basis for decisions uh, on, on a higher uh, public level. Uh, also something about his ability to may or plan, present and follow up on budgets, uh, and also his abilities to plan, execute, evaluate on surveys, tests and, and experiments and so on. So that's the overall background that we will evaluate uh, Morten up against. He has obviously not read this, so we will have to uh, wing this in as we speak. <laughs> but um, what we also will be looking for uh, is his ability to transform, as Benedicta said, his experience into something that he hasn't really been focusing on in his studies. So we, we've stripped down his uh, CV to uh, the day that he, um, he got his um, PhD title uh, and seen uh, and also have an overview over the extracurriculum activities. So um, we will then be, uh, just to repeat what uh, Benedicta said, we will be looking at, okay, does he have the experience to do the functions in this job? He obviously has experience in other areas, but can we transform them? We will also be looking at, okay, his abilities to transform this, uh, his motivation. Is he running from something or to something? Which is a big difference, because all everybody wants to employ someone who wants to work for them, not somebody who's running away from something else. And we'll also be looking uh, for his to understand his personality or his ability to blend in the environment that, will, that he will work together with. So that would be the things that we have in mind when, when going through the CV. Mm. So if you could just uh, go to uh, Morten's uh, CV. It's there. No. There it is. Thank you. Um, um, okay, so let's start uh, the interview. Uh, Morten, uh, you've got a brief overview over the position. So now we would like you to go through your CV and tell us about the milestones that you think are the most important for this position. 
give us examples. Yeah, I can uh, go back to, uh, I think I have to go back to the, uh, my grandfather. <laughs> he, was, uh, he was my, um, uh, he, was, uh, he is, the, in my view, the most wise man I've ever known. And he uh, gave me some good advice until he died when I was 13. And uh, the reason for having a lot of contact with him was that he was, uh, I was living on a farm and he also lived on the farm. He was, had his pension, so he said, was always at home. My, uh, my father and mother was out working, so I had a lot of nice discussions with my, uh, my, uh, my grandfather. And he said to me at some point in time, you know, uh, Morten, uh, um, work is about uh, creating collective power under the cultivation of individual skills. And uh, that's also leadership or something he said when he, because he was a, a managing director at a sawmill uh, when he, before he retired. So this, this is a milestone for me. And of course, uh, I was uh, fairly good in mathematics. So I have a teacher at high school who actually gave me the most important advice in my life. You have to study mathematics at the University of Oslo. So uh, I decided to apply for for uh, a, uh, uh, the study programs here and uh, started it with mathematics in 1979 and finished my master. At the time I finished my master, I had, didn't have a clue about uh, getting a PhD, but uh, I uh, went to a center for industrial research and I got into a project, a fairly practical project, with was on the international level. Uh, with people in uh, in Germany uh, on uh, programming uh, fairly yeah, algorithms based on the mathematics I've learned at uh, in my master thesis, and suddenly uh, it came up there was a scholarship there for a PhD, so I applied for that, and then I went into the, back to the university d doing my PhD under uh, supervision here. If we can pause you there for a little second, yeah. you, you said about the the program uh, that you were participating in, or you were programming algorithms. Yeah. What was the use of those algorithms? Uh, quite concrete, it uh, had to do with, uh, uh, there was the Hewlett Packard in Germany, and they were uh, producing so-called CAD systems to uh, construct the geometry of cars and parts of cars for, I think it was Benz or Maybe it was uh, Mercedes-Benz, I, I don't remember exactly. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was something wrong there in the mathematics, so I, was, uh, I had to go to Germany to, to, to fix the problem, and it took me about three months to fix that problem. Because when you do these algorithms, you, you have a point, you measure points on, for example, the hood, and you are going to make a mathematical model, a surface representing the hood. And there was some, something wrong in, in the software. So I was sent down to Germany to try to fix that software. Uh, it took me three months to do it, and uh, after three months I found a small detail, very, very deep down in the code, that uh, was fixed, and that was my first <coughs> job after my master thesis. Okay. Um, since... Uh, was Sorry. that as a part of uh, uh, as a part of a student? Uh, no, then I was an employee at the Center for okay. Industrial Research. Okay. And when I came back from this uh, this uh, half or this project, which lasted for about a year, mm -hmm. I was offered offered this uh, PhD scholarship. Mm. Right. Uh, I just need to ask one question because uh, in your PhD uh, mm -hmm. you um, uh, focus on box splines and application of polynomial splines. Yes which is uh, um, quite special, isn't it? Yes, it's, uh, uh, you can divide my thesis into two parts. Mm. The half of it is, is quite theoretical. Mm. And box splines is uh, splines is piecewise polynomials. Mm. You pick a polynomial and you hook another polynomial onto that in order to model uh, surfaces and curves. So it is within the same topic as I, uh, as I worked with, with Hewlett Packard and uh, Daimler-Benz. Mm. However, it was more on the theoretical part. Okay. That was the, that was the theory thing. And I, I learned a lot about how to create algorithms, how to program in order to see whether or not these functions could work as basis functions for modeling geometric uh, shapes. 
So it has nothing to do with maps uh, no, necessarily. No, it, it, it could have because yeah. when you come to the application part, you could use these uh, curves and surfaces to model maps of, this, of, of the uh, terrain models mm. and also model uh, uh, curves in maps. Mm. And, you, and they were used as, um, as, uh, as, as a part to, for example, modeling cars and parts of cars. And uh, I have been said that there is some ideas also uh, in uh, late in a couple of years that you could we will maybe be able to use this also modeling parts of the human body, for example, the human heart. But that I don't know anything about. So, but I've heard some rumors. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Please continue. <laughs> <laughs> <So> <laughs> uh, um, uh, um, but the other part, as it was, it said applications of polynomial splines, mm. and uh, that was the two main applications was uh, was uh, maps, and uh, worked a little bit together with the uh, Statens Kartverk, mm. the Norwegian mapping authorities, and uh, together with uh, also together with Center for Industrial Research, I continued a little part time in the in the project, together with Center for Industrial Research and and Willow Packard programming these new type of functions and see if they did work in, in the, an industrial setting. But I have to be honest, they didn't work. Mm. So we had to go to find some other type of functions to, to solve this particular program. So part of my thesis is actually a dead end, but I've learned a lot from that as mm. well. Mm. Mm. That's interesting. Mm. So when, when we go to your work experience, you, um, you have given us an overview of what you've done. But the interesting thing, wh when we want to go behind what Morten says and, and find out how can we actually decrypt uh, uh, the information and transfer it to, to, uh, to this position, what on, on which level when you did this um, uh, programming or you did this hydrating? Uh, um, in English, but when you uh, error correction, yeah, error correction. At which level were you? Were you sort of into the coding, or did you see at the total structure, as in architecture, of where you got the information from? Yeah, to a certain extent, I was uh, since my background, my master thesis. What I did in my master thesis was quite relevant for digging deep into the code. So uh, part of the job was together with a lot of colleagues at the uh, at Center for Industrial Research, trying to, to understand the whole system. But I was fairly fast at a couple of months. I was asked to go to Germany and really dig into that detail. And then I had to work on my own quite a lot. Mm -hmm. But uh, of course, report back to, to my manager, both here in, in Oslo and at the Hewlett Packard in Berlingen, mm -hmm. uh, where I, uh, because, uh, yeah, so we discussed my, uh, the, the approach and thing because we had to set up a test system. So, so I had to collaborate with people. But when I really worked on, on, the, on the subject, on the problem, I was very much alone with that mm. problem. But I had to have people to discuss. I had people to discuss the problem. Mm. And I was uh, not on daily basis, but fairly, uh, quite often I was asked, where am I? Have I done? So I, I could ask some question about uh, different issues that was uh, different mm -hmm. problems that I had. Uh, so when you mentioned you set up test systems, what, what did you do in setting up these systems? Were you sort of yeah. planning, executing? Yeah, I, I did most of the planning. I, uh, what, what you have to do when you're going to test software like that, where you, you don't know where the errors are. There are something there uh, because at it, and, and the error doesn't come and it comes suddenly and then it disappears again, but it, it's there. Mm -hmm. So there is some sort of a leak in the memory structure of, of the programs or, or anything. So do you have to, but there are something wrong. So I had to, um, I had to set up a test where I, I um, uh, and I, it was actually a hood on a, on a, on a vehicle, on a car, uh, with a fixed number of points that we are going to approximate with a surface and I had to run this test many, many times with small uh, perturbations in, in moving the points a little and until uh, the, the error happened and then register that. Uh, that. And uh, that 
partly worked, but we really have to go into the code and, and do other things as well. So I had to plan the whole, the whole um, setup and then run it. And after about one and a half months or maybe two months, I think one and a half a month I was on track and after two months we solved the problem. And it actually was a fairly, uh, yeah. yeah. When you see the problem, it's easy to see it, but um, um, but at the time, uh, I don't know exactly what uh, what we found, but it was uh, was something like a memory leak. But it's not exactly that either. Uh, uh, just a final question: um, When you finished this assignment, yeah, was it generate or did you have to generate and present a kind of of uh, executive summary without any code lines or anything, oh, yeah. or did you just fix it and then it was done? I, I had to file a, a fairly big report on what I have done and uh, what uh, and exactly what was was the, the findings of the job, and uh, I think I can say that uh, they were very happy in Berlingen, so they tried to hire me <laughs> after that uh, that uh, endeavor. But um, I decided to stay in Norway and, uh, because I, I got this uh, scholarship for a PhD. Mm. Uh, so that was uh, so. If I hadn't have got that scholarship, I maybe I had moved to, to Germany at the time. I don't have you ever thought about that? What had happened if you went to Germany at that time? I have thought about it, but uh, not too far. No, no, no. And you never regret. No, I don't, no. because I uh, I got the best uh, supervisor <laughs> I could get here in Norway, yeah, so which I was good. very satisfied. Which is good. Um, I just want to ask you: uh, you have been uh, a student uh, since. 1980, yeah. so it's um, 10 years almost of studying directly from your uh, high school yeah. uh, period, so it's actually 13 years. Um, and you've been able to, to dig your way into something that really interests you. Uh, in this job, uh, something will be very interesting and something probably won't. So, uh, have you experienced up till now working with something that you don't really uh, get a kick off? <laughs> uh, I'm, um, if you, I'm, I have lived on a farm until I was 19 years old, and if you are working on the barn <laughs> with grass, uh, um, um, I, I don't know why I can say this in English, but you have. You have a silo and you have grass and you walk around to, to, to press the, the grass. I think and when you do that for a couple of weeks, you are quite bored. <laughs> uh, you still do it. Uh, the, yeah, the, now uh, there, there are other, uh, uh, the, no, in 2000. Yeah, they still do it. We are in 1990. They still do it. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, but, you keep but, on. But, you keep uh, on doing it even uh, though you're bored. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I kept on doing it. And of course, uh, one of the... I had a summer jobs at the Upland Skogselskap. Mm. I was running up and uh, down hillsides in, in Valdres and Gubbrandstein, mm. uh, where we, they were going to construct roads to yeah. to um, to um, to uh, drive timber and, and uh, firewood out. And of course, part of that job is is not that e exciting, but it was good income. So, uh, two three summers as a um, as a some kind of a mountain climber in uh, Valdres and uh, Gubbrandstein gave me a good uh, a financial position when I came back to the university in, uh, in the autumn. Yeah. So I, I could finance my studies for like mm. three years. Mm. And I, I lived up there for five weeks on, uh, on a row because you go up into Gubbrandstein or Valdres and you stay there for five weeks and you do the job and then you are coming back. Of course, there was, uh, I was sometimes during these, uh, these days, of course, I, I felt a little bored, but uh, I worked hard. I worked up to 10 hours every day for seven days a week. Uh, but that gave me, uh, I could afford uh, a lot of beer when I came yeah. back to the... Yeah, gave you money, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, in the other end, uh, what really gives you a kick mm. uh, um, when you... Uh, let's stay to work. Uh, mm. uh, or, yeah, uh, let's, uh, let's talk about work first, and then yeah. we'll talk about what you do after, or in, uh, on your spare time afterwards. Yeah, it, what's... Gives me. A, I'm. I'm. I'm about to be a f become a father very soon. Oh. So I think that will uh, that will uh, take some time. Um, uh, right now, I will be a grandfather very soon. But that's another story. <laughs> 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 that will also take my time. But uh, uh, no, I. I. Um, I. Uh, what I like to do is, uh, in particular, I. I've played soccer for all my life, and I still do that. And I'm 
think I'm going to do that for a few years. And, uh, and I have a lot of friends that I am, I do this uh, sport with. I also, uh, I also like to do some kayaking. Mm. Uh, so uh, this is the thing I do. And, and what really gives me a kick, uh, good discussions with uh, friends. Mm. Uh, What's that mö part? That's mö part. That's uh, my. Uh, that's uh, something that. Um, well, I had a friend called Evin, and uh, we decided that this was actually a, a party at uh, William Bjergnes' house at uh, the University of Oslo, where we were asked to um, come up with a sketch or a, or a, a joke on on the stage, and we uh, did something together. And that worked. It was uh, inspired by Monty Python, so it was kind <laughs> of black. So we did that once, and then we decided, okay, let's do it once more. So uh, the group Mö was established, and I think we had about 50 cabarets at the University of Oslo over four or five years. You still do it? Uh, at home, <laughs> in the shower. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, yeah. so you're an active, active person uh, outside of uh, uh, outside of the university as well, which is uh, which is interesting. Um, My grandfather has said that okay, you are the, the, your main interest is that is uh, is soccer or football and mathematics. Okay, and that was true. I, thought yeah. I was fairly interested in football and, and mathematics when I was a young kid, and he tried to understand why. Mm. I remember quite well. <laughs> Um, we won't be able to do a full uh, no. uh, interview, but it's just to, to show that something is uh, mm. what you do, um, what you do uh, daytime working, and uh, uh, it's also interesting to to check out uh, check out what interests you have uh, uh, outside of uh, wh what you do daytime, um, because. Um, it uh, shows uh, kind of uh, uh, we're looking into a kind of cultural fit. Uh, we're looking into a, a kind of uh, um, blending in, um, and if there are a lot of uh, things to to uh, to um, a lot of hooks uh, when it comes to to uh, who the person is, or if it's a narrow, uh, a more narrow uh, road there. So um, uh, part of the interview will be a kind of chat mm -hmm. with uh, what you like to do, what makes you happy, what makes you uh, angry, what makes you uh, uh, bored, and so on, to just check out uh, some of these, uh, these issues as well. Um, if I may, I I'd like to, to uh, add on a couple of comments on what we well, could assume that you have that you didn't say directly. Uh, uh, versus the, the position here. Um, we didn't go through what kind of preparations were you doing before you gave these lectures that you gave at that time. Uh, but that tells us something about the structure, uh, something about ability to prepare, ability to communicate something that the, the audience or, or, or uh, the students are supposed to remember afterwards as well. So. Um, we, we discussed about your um, experience with making summaries. You told that you had made a huge summary uh, after the, the um, assignment. But what we would then need to ask you on the following interview would be, okay, would you be able to make these short and executive summaries so that they are so short that basically everybody bothers to read the entire summary? Mm -hmm. uh, which, which would be a, a difficulty if we uh, produce uh, many pages. You told us about the, the um, uh, ability to work with statistics to find out, okay, where are the mistakes here? Um, to develop mathematical models uh, indirectly, you, well, we can assume that you did that. Um, you had to present findings, present results. Uh, we didn't come. Uh, we didn't touch into budgets and, and um, how to follow up on that. That would be a point to look further in, into. Um, but we see that you have the potential to do this position. 
but we would need to dig further into it. Um, this is only an, an excerpt from, from, an, from an interview, uh, but do you um, in the audience have any questions that you were thinking, aren't they going to ask that? Would you, when you see uh, Morten's CV and then you hear the questions that we ask within this limited uh, time frame, do you have anything that you would think that would be natural to ask for? Based on your experience? Yeah. So my name is Anders, I'm a PhD student in physics. Uh, this is a question not really directed to Martin, but something you might uh, tell me. It's about employability of postdocs. Mm -hmm. Because many PhDs are going towards a postdoc, and right now there are approximately 2,000 postdocs in Norway, mm -hmm. but only one in five get a permanent position in academia. So you, get, you have more than 1,500 postdocs, uh, and they must do something else. So how would you consider a candidate with a postdoc or the same candidate before they took a postdoc? Do you consider it a bad thing that they did choose that and fail their academic, yeah? Um, uh, yeah. Well, um, there are, as, as um, uh, Benedicta uh, said initially, uh, there are always some assumptions about a PhD or a postdoc. Uh, so that really depends on uh, which benchmark candidates do you have, what is the growth potential in the position, uh, what is the personality of the two candidates like, uh, how blendable are they um, into the environment, what is the, the let's say, growth potential within the company, uh, whether they would see the postdoc as, as a, a very good opportunity, but we cannot utilize it. And, and you would also have to consider, if it is a benchmark candidate uh, present, what has the benchmark candidate done while the postdoc was actually doing the PhD? So, it's really a lot of factors that, that will influence on whether the postdoc is the best fit for the function or not. But in cases where the company or the position has the growth potential, I would say that the client would, would investigate the postdoc first. Normally, the postdocs would be uh, the ones with with uh, the biggest potential, and because they haven't been in their corporate life for many years, they are relatively more affordable. So that also comes into consideration. It's a, it's a long answer for a short question, but it's... Um, if you want, we can discuss that further on afterwards. But it is a very important question because a, a lot of uh, our students, PhD candidates, postdocs, and, and researchers are uh, not concerned, but they are interested in, in uh, an answer like that. And it, it's also a quite complicated situation because for us, no, I'm a dean, to, to really answer these questions in a proper way. And that's why we're also having these sessions and also put employability on the, um, on the agenda for meetings like this. Mm. Okay. Um, um, I'm uh, also a physicist, uh, finishing my PhD this year. Uh, I have a question with two parts. First, um, it says there that Morten is married and is expecting a son in December. Would you ask him anything about this? Uh, yes, we would uh, definitely uh, uh, ask him uh, about that. If, if it was today, uh, I would expect that he would like to be at home with his child for a while. So I would probably today ask him if, uh, what are your plans for sharing uh, your uh, maternity leave or, or paternity leave? Yeah. Mm. Um, in 1989, I'm not that sure. I'm not that sure if I yeah. would have asked him in 1989 whether he was going to take a leave uh, from yeah. work or not. Yes, no, I'm, I'm today I would expect yeah. it. Yeah. Um, 
But you wouldn't, you would probably not expect him to be at home for one year because, well, my question is, since mm. I'm a woman, mm. if it's me and I'm seven months pregnant mm. when I'm with your interview, mm. how would that, how would you think about that? Would, would that affect anything, truthfully? Uh, well, uh, to be very honest with you, uh, if I ran a small company uh, and uh, interviewed uh, a, a woman seven months pregnant, I would definitely give it a thought. Can I afford this? Uh, I mean, I need, uh, I need the, uh, the um, uh, expertise, I need the, uh, the work hours now. Uh, and uh, I would definitely need to talk to you about how are you planning on your maternity leave? Because if you said that you were going to be away for a year, I, I couldn't probably in any circumstance afford to hire you at that moment. Um, but if uh, there were uh, a kind of uh, share or a split on that, it would probably be easier. But if I was a big company, and I've been working with big companies who's been in exactly that situation, it was four months pregnant, and uh, the candidate was definitely the best. Um, and uh, uh, we had a discussion uh, about, uh, okay, she is going to be away for so and so uh, long time. And they said, hey, we're planning for the future. So if we can't do this, who can? So this was a big, uh, big company. And that's probably also an issue, smaller big companies and, uh, and uh, the uh, affordableness. Um, and, um, and uh, thinking of that. But the nice thing about PhDs is that you have so much knowledge about your topic or discipline that the benchmark candidate isn't by far as good as the PhD. So something is worth waiting for, but the, the, the client always looks at the utilization of their um, uh, investment mm. in the person. Mm. So it's, uh, as you say, Peter, it's, uh, it's uh, also about benchmark. If you have two candidates that are just as good, uh, it's another issue uh, than if you have one candidate who is um, specifically good. Mm. So we had, I think we had one question here, or? No, okay. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Frederick, a PhD in mathematics. Um, I have a question about um, non-formal knowledge, that is, knowledge acquired outside academia. For example, some people uh, know how to program, uh, uh, but don't have the study points to prove it. Um, in what way can I show that at an interview, <laughs> if that's relevant? Mm. Uh, well, if, um, if uh, I understand uh, you right here, then it's, uh, it's a question of how can you uh, show that you know uh, a lot about an area uh, without having any papers on it or without, yeah. Uh, well, um, when it comes to how to use your, uh, your competence uh, and how to solve uh, the job uh, that we're talking about, you would probably have a have a chance to to talk about your competence in that area as well uh, and show that you have the competence and show that uh, this is uh, something that I can choose that, that that I can use uh, in my in my job and that I know of and that I'm interested in and you can also talk about it uh, as an interest if I may add on a, a comment on that mm. you when, when having that kind of, of uh, extracurriculum uh, expertise or experience, then you should give examples telling the one who's listening about, okay, within programming, were I just doing error correction? Was I working on uh, um, an application? Was I working on a system? Was I working at an architect uh, level? So, so you try to, to place it within uh, the pyramid so that he or she understands how they can apply that kind of extra expertise. Uh, and I see that we're running out of time, so we'll be sending out some uh, information afterwards for those who want to have that about how you can actually, let's say, decrypt 
uh, your profiles or your CVs because what we generally see is that PhDs uh, describe themselves uh, with long sentences, lots of references, uh, um, lots of, uh, let's say, um, uh, PhD codes which are not understandable for the ones. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think this is also a very good question. I think uh, throughout your life, you should collect these things. Uh, when in, I was not, when I go back to 1990, I really didn't understand why this cabaret thing was important for me mm. at the time, mm. because I did it for fun. Uh, and however, uh, being on this stage, not here, but uh, down in Eidalskjellar uh, or wherever we were at the time, actually gave me a lot in how to perform things, mm. how to talk to the audience. So uh, I, I learned a lot through these uh, three, four years together with Eivind, uh, uh, telling uh, dirty stories about uh, whatever and, and, and <laughs> having fun with Monty Python sketches. Uh, so, um, not sketches, but, but jokes. Uh, and I think all of you should collect what are you good at? that you don't really have on your CV mm. and trying to, to put that into uh, some sort of perspective with the, the, uh, at, the at the job interview. Uh, I think uh, a few years later, let's say in 95 or 2000, I really understood why these, uh, these jokes together with Erwin was important for me as, as a person because it gave me experience as a teacher, it gave me experience to talking to audiences in, in, in different places. So. So this is something you can you can collect, and it could be something really different. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. The X factor. Mm. Um, uh, just just to to help you out a little bit further, uh, Jürgen here, if you just <laughs> stand up, or most of the, most of you probably uh, know about him. Um, he uh, and I had a meeting a couple of uh, weeks ago when, when we went through his experience and looked at his LinkedIn profile, uh, where he uh, received a couple of tips on how to improve that. So if you have questions around that, we will send you some general tips and ideas. And, and you can also speak with Jürgen just to have a, um, well, more live examples on, on, on how things can be done differently. And I'd like to add another uh, comment. We are fortunate to have two PhDs among us who have uh, done the transition from academic functions to more corporate functions. That's uh, Tadia and uh, Jorge. If you would uh, raise up and just tell which discipline you come from and what you do today, uh, they will also be joining us uh, in the lunch so you can have a, an opportunity to speak more with them just to see how that works in real life. Okay, so I'm Tarje. I did my uh, master here at uh, Kristine Bonnevis Hus and my uh, PhD at Radium Hospitalet with uh, in molecular biology. Uh, after that, I did my postdoc, so I thought it was wise to have a postdoc. Uh, it kind of gave me an extra selection criteria. You're even smarter than the PhDs. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I applied for a job which where Petter uh, was the headhunter to in, in the pharmaceutical industry. So now I'm a medical advisor in uh, cancer and medicines. So if you want to talk, I'm, I'm here for the next hour. Thank you. Yes, hello. Um, I'm Jörg Kramer. I got my PhD here at IFI in 2009. And then um, first I worked at ABB uh, with industrial communication. And now I work at Mnemonic and I work with IT security problems most related to automation. And I have two points to add. One, I guess a lot of you already know phdcomics.com. All true. <laughs> the, the second <laughs> is that, that I think the best investment in my life was actually spending a few thousand on, uh, on an outplacement program, which was actually recommended by, by Peter. Uh, because uh, there you are actually getting a help to, to change your career, to, to help how you, how you talk on interviews and so. I think that was that was very useful for me. Hmm. Cool. Okay. So uh, there's just one thing that we noticed is that we're so sorry that smartphones and social media wasn't invented in the 80s 
because we would really like to see that from, from your show. More. <laughs> um, thank you so much for a very interesting interview situation, and I hope you all um, caught a few tips and hints here and there. Um, we'd like to thank you with a box of chocolate. Leva, can you hand it to me, please? Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you.